Enjoy the musical exploration of Yorkshire's history and culture on the Tim Music World podcast. Hello, this is the Tim Music World podcast for February 2022. It's the first podcast of the year and it's a specially extended edition, over 50 minutes long. It features a presentation about the life of Captain James Cook and it features songs from the Captain James Cook's Journeys album and it forms the basis of some performances I'll be doing later this year. In the presentation I'm playing the tracks directly from the album but in the uh, concerts later this year I'll be performing the songs live with backing tracks as well as doing the presentation. So who was Captain James Cook? Captain James Cook was one of the greatest explorers of all time. He redrew the 18th century maps of the world and solved several mysteries of the then largely unknown South Pacific. He did all that, but along the way lost very few men to scurvy, a major problem at the time, with some ships losing 80% of their crew on a long ocean voyage. Cook solved that problem by pioneering healthy diets for his crew. He received a medal from the Royal Society for this achievement. He was in fact elected to be a Fellow of the Royal Society. Additionally, he rose from being the son of a farmer to becoming a national hero in England for his seafaring accomplishments. Cook was born in a place near to my home in North Yorkshire, England, which is how I firstly got interested in his story. I'll be talking about Cook and illustrating his life by performing songs taken from a musical play which Frederick MacKinnon and I created. Presenting the songs in a chronological fashion will provide you with a good introduction to Cook's life. In these songs, I'll be playing Cook or his sailors or officers. In the stage version, there are, of course, many different characters. James Cook was born in Martin in Yorkshire, which is in northeastern England, in 1728. Eight years later, the family moved to Great Ayton, where he was a diligent student at school. For leisure, he would climb a nearby hill, Rosebury Topping, to enjoy the view of the sea. In 1745, when he was 16, James moved to the fishing village of Staithes, to be apprenticed to a grocer and haberdasher, William Sanderson. This is where Cook first felt the lure of the sea by listening to the tales of the sea from fishermen. After 18 months, Cook travelled to the nearby port town of Whitby to be introduced to Sanderson's friend and shipowner, John Walker, to be considered for an apprenticeship aboard ships. The play commences as James Cook age 17, has just ascended a hill overlooking Whitby Harbour, where he hopes he will start a new life at sea. Dance and fortitude be the winds that fill my sails to achieve my life's ambition and lead me on great missions as a Yorkshire farm boy roseberry topping I would climb to view the sea beyond the shore of the world's meant to find As a toiling village shop lad With a teeming ocean near I sense a passion in my soul As sailors' tales I'd hear Now it's time to be master of my fate 
On with bishops I'll go to sail the great North Sea I'll study seamanship and stars, there's something calling me Prospects of adventure Let providence and fortitude be the winds that fill my sails To achieve my life's ambition And lead me on great missions Life on the land is not for me I want to be free I can see Prospects of adventure I can see Prospects of adventure Let providence and fortitude Be the winds that fill my sails To achieve my life's ambition And lead me on great missions Prospects of adventure Prospects of adventure The Walkers were a prominent local ship-owning family in the coal trade. Their house on Grape Lane is now the Captain Cook Memorial Museum, and it's where Cook lived during his apprenticeship. Cook was taken on as an apprentice in their small fleet of colliers, plying coal along England's east coast. During his apprenticeship, Cook, with an eye to future advancement, applied himself to the study of algebra, geometry, trigonometry, navigation and astronomy, all skills he would need one day to command his own ship. In 1755, within a month of being offered command of his own vessel, he volunteered for service in the Royal Navy, when Britain was rearming for what was to become the Seven Years' War. Despite the need to start back at the bottom of the naval hierarchy, Cook hoped his career would advance more quickly in military service. Walker respected his decision, but pointed out that he'd have very little chance for promotion, as becoming a commissioned officer in the Royal Navy was highly unlikely for the son of a farmer. But James was not to be deterred once he'd set his mind on something. Then, as the war with France was being played out in what is now Canada, his navigation mastery and newly acquired surveying skills contributed to the British victory over the French at Quebec. Later, the 29-year-old Yorkshireman was appointed King's Surveyor for Newfoundland, where he created charts for newly acquired area of Nova Scotia and Newfoundland. Because of his previous experience and the expertise he developed at surveying and map making, he gained the favour of many of his superiors and quickly rose in rank from ordinary seaman to ship's master. The 34-year-old Navy man returned to England in December of 1762, where he enjoyed time at home and at the Bell Inn in Wapping, his favourite pub. In fact, over the years, Cook had struck up a close friendship with Elizabeth Batts, the daughter of the landlord Samuel Batts. One afternoon, James entered the inn and started a conversation with Elizabeth, which would be important to their future and legacy. Like many times in the life of James Cook, he had an objective and faithfully pursued it. I've survived great battles and fought the raging sea But never gave my heart to a last so dear to me at this time in my life I should be a married man I would like a wife and children Will she give me her hand? In a world of changing fortune Two things to enjoy Loyalty and love 
loyalty and love I'll pledge my heart forever That I can be sure Loyalty and love Loyalty and love in romance Will I know what to say How can I let her know I can't see our wedding day A little early for dinner, Mr Cook Father said you were in this morning to have a talk with him Will you have your usual ale? No, thank you, Miss Butts. Hot tea will be fine. I once knew little sweet Beth As only a darling child But now she's the one man Today my heart's beguiled I've not been versed in romance But I'll know what to say and I must let her know I can see our wedding day I'll pledge my heart forever That I can be sure Loyalty and love Loyalty and love Fortunately for James, Elizabeth accepted his proposal. There was, however, some trepidation on her part in marrying a navy man who'd frequently be away at sea. And so James, at the age of 34, and Elizabeth, at the age of 21, married on the 21st of December, 1762. As Elizabeth had feared, her husband would be away from home frequently, but at first it was only for several months at a time. This was when he was in charge of surveying Newfoundland in the summer months. During this time he achieved the rank of Navy Master. When he was at home with Elizabeth and their three children, he produced charts of superior quality, consequently gaining the attention of the Admiralty. He also obtained the respect of the Royal Society by publishing his observations of a solar eclipse. Six years later, James Cook began to achieve the notoriety he desired. The Admiralty, in planning an extraordinary voyage, considered it necessary to have a commander skilled in navigation, leadership, cartography and astronomy, and the ideal choice was James. So, by special arrangement, he was commissioned as an officer to enable him to command the Whitby-built HMB Endeavour as First Lieutenant, this would prove to be James Cook's first circumnavigation of the globe. The initial part of this first great voyage was to be historic. After traversing 14,000 miles, a great deal of which was uncharted waters, he was to observe and measure a rare astronomical occurrence, the 1769 transit of Venus on the island of Tahiti in the South Pacific Ocean. The transit of Venus involved observing Venus moving across the face of the Sun, and those results would help to improve navigational calculations. With the addition of artists, botanists and naturalists on board, Cook took command of the world's first multi-year scientific voyage of discovery. The transit of Venus was successfully observed. Soon after, the Endeavour embarked on the next aspects of its voyage, the discovery, exploration and charting of new lands encountered, and the search for the legendary Terra Australis Incognita. This was a hypothetical continent based on the idea that continental land in the Northern Hemisphere should be balanced by land in the Southern Hemisphere. After surveying several yet unrecorded South Pacific Islands, Cook headed southwards. Fifty-nine days at sea without sighting land have passed as we now join the Endeavour. 
59 days upon the seas Rations of salt, beef, gruel and peas Today, tomorrow, the same routine The only females are in our dreams Today, tomorrow, the same routines Searching for land nobody has seen Land we do not know Land ho, land ho Man the yards, trim the sails Land ho, land ho Land ho, land ho Natives with clubs and pointy spears Women with flowers behind their ears Strange tribes who munch on flesh Can put our humanity to the test Fresh picked fruit and fresh shot game Daily meals not always the same Land ho Land ho Exotic and lusty new lands Might perhaps be almost at hand Never know what sights we might see Making some British history Captain Cook will direct our way Grub and girls are home for today Land ho, land ho this land we do not know Land ho, land ho Man the yards, trim the sails Land ho, land ho Land ho, land ho Land ho the land sighted by Lieutenant Cook and his crew was New Zealand, and the initial encounters with the proud Maori warriors were extremely disheartening for James Cook, as several natives were killed by the superior British firearms. Nevertheless, Cook was eventually able to establish friendly and peaceful relations on various occasions, enabling him to trade for much-needed supplies as well as fresh vegetables and abundant fish for his crew. Two mighty peoples, noble tribes and royal crown In God's eyes we're equal We'll be known to all the world Two Histories bold and brave With righteous aspirations Will be known to all the world Let peace prevail in New Zealand Let peace prevail Let peace prevail in New Zealand Let peace prevail Two mighty sagas Of courage, craft and art Both with human dramas Will be known to all the world Two Mighty lands achieving peace and honor, holding out our hands, will be known to all the world. Let peace prevail. One mighty design, trading and advancement. 
lessons for mankind will be known to all the world. Let peace prevail in New Zealand. Let peace prevail. Let peace prevail in New Zealand Let peace prevail During the six months the endeavour spent in New Zealand waters, Cook charted 2,400 miles of coast and demonstrated it consisted of two islands, thus proving it was not the yet undiscovered southern continent. Because he was eventually able to establish friendly relations with the Maori, New Zealand was a place he returned to many times, obtaining food and supplies with equitable trade during his three Pacific voyages. In 1770, on his first voyage, he encountered Australia, not realising it was a whole continent, and created the first charts of its east coast, before continuing on his journey home yet he would not rejoin Elizabeth and their children for another year and nine months. Elizabeth, like many wives of seamen of that time, demonstrated extraordinary strength by caring on her own for her family. On this particular occasion, she returns home after the funeral of her four-year-old daughter. She sings, So Long Gone. you by my side to share our fates and withstand the tides we pledged our love to endure the years we look to life's fortune with hope and no fears so long stars for the one we made ours so long gone shouldn't you be here with me I know my role as a discoverer's wife strong and I bear the pain we made our vows James you're not to blame
On that first voyage, James Cook did not find Terra Incognita Australis, but the charts he produced of the South Pacific Ocean proved to be invaluable. Artists' renditions of exotic flora and fauna, spectacular landscapes and indigenous peoples, along with Cook's journal, became the talk of the day, not only in England, but throughout Europe. Soon to follow was James Cook's second Pacific expedition. This was undertaken in 1772, traversing 67,000 miles in nearly four years, at that time dispelling the theory of a great undiscovered South Pacific landmass. Cook's achievements on this second voyage were considerable. He was the first to venture south of the Antarctic Circle and he also visited many Pacific islands, including Easter Island and Fiji. His explorations further improved the map of the Southern Hemisphere. He also continued to establish measures to preserve the health of British seamen and prevent scurvy. On his return home, James Cook became even more of a celebrated British hero. Following on from the second voyage, James Cook was designated as a post-captain and he was honoured with a position at Greenwich Hospital where he would have a comfortable income and the opportunity to stay at home with Elizabeth and their three boys. Elizabeth was elated at the news but knowing her husband's ambitious nature she became justifiably apprehensive particularly as the Admiralty was looking for someone to lead yet another Pacific expedition this time to find the North West Passage, a sea route connecting the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans through ice-laden Arctic waters. Another honour bestowed upon Cook was to have his portrait painted by Nathaniel Dance, one of the most famous artists of the time. When sitting for his now famous portrait, the next song is sung, demonstrating Cook's concern about his new retirement role at Greenwich Hospital, a position which would no longer allow him to go to sea. Let me see a blue horizon And an island will be found Allow me the vast Pacific Not a city where I'm bound I want a blue horizon A blue horizon I am the son of land Hailed as master of the sea The ocean is in my soul And the wind has set me free I've gone farther than any man I sail from pole to pole My charts will be my legacy I've been two times round the globe Let me see a blue horizon And an island will be found Allow me the vast Pacific Not a city where I'm bound I want a blue horizon I know I've been away from my family a great deal For years at a time But once my objectives had been achieved I always returned Home to my sons and Beth Across the azure seas Back to my heart's desire Is 
where I ought to be Now my journals do I write Some prominent maps begun At home with Beth and the boys Honor and position one Yeah, when I see a blue horizon An island will be found Allow me the vast Pacific Not a city where I'm bound I want a blue horizon Blue horizon A few months ago the whole southern hemisphere was hardly big enough for me and now the Admiralty ceased to reward me by having me serve my country sitting behind a desk at Greenwich Hospital Now my journals I do write Some prominent maps begun A desk is my command Are my voyages all done? They say this son of land is called master of the sea Only the worldwide oceans and the wind can set me free When I sail the blue horizon, many islands would be found Once I had the vast Pacific, not a city where I'm bound I want a blue horizon I need a blue horizon In modern colloquial terms, we might say that Cook didn't quit while he was ahead. James ultimately could not resist the temptation of leading the upcoming Northwest Passage voyage. Much to the annoyance of his beloved Elizabeth, he volunteered to command what would be a fateful voyage. This would be his third and final voyage, when things went horribly wrong for him, perhaps because of his overzealous ambition and pride and the fact he'd been at sea for nearly eight of the past ten years and found life on the land too dull. Journals of that third voyage, later obtained by the Admiralty, revealed Captain Cook's growing frustration with problems he'd had on all his voyages. His crew being responsible for the spread of venereal disease, as well as their indiscriminate use of firearms, and thefts by the natives. To deal with the pilfering of particularly valuable items, Cook's strategy was to invite the native royalty on board his ship and essentially keep them hostage until the stolen objects were returned. The chiefs would later be appeased by presenting them with gifts. His rationale was to utilise the hostage ploy to avoid bloodshed while maintaining British esteem. A further problem which was unusual for Cook, was that this time he'd failed to personally oversee the refurbishment and fitting of his ship, something he'd normally been very careful about. This led to many problems and the need for repairs during the voyage. Indeed, his crew were starting to complain about his mood swings, harsh treatment, not being allowed to have contact with native women, food rationing, and been required to drink sugarcane beer, a prized innovation by the captain. Here we have a song from his crew expressing their discontent. The old man has seen better days We best be careful what we say we're just some rogues before the yard tending to rigging fore and aft round the horn we gladly came thought we gain a red 
little fame But now at sea and discontent Wondering when hardship will relent The old man has seen better days We best be careful what we say Never thought on ocean waves We'd harbor thoughts of mutinous ways Maybe we need to be a little brave Better still we'll just hope and pray the old man has seen better days We best be careful what we say Aware of the fact he's losing respect from his crew, Cook sings a song, showing him reflecting on the difficulties he is facing. There was a time when goals were set Objectives met, passions pure My fame secure Dreams and aspirations turned to dust Tainted by man's desires and lust How easy to become fortune's fool the winds of fate and bitter and cruel I never asked for an easy course I never thought there would be no cost Fair weather comes and goes But why now, why now Do I feel dispirited and lost? Aren't I the same James Cook? Yet my sweet Beth seems so far away I fear for my little boys today Have I been led by pure ambition In taking on this futile mission? Dreams and aspirations turn to dust Tainted by man's desires and lust How easy to become fortune's fool The winds of fate turn bitter and cruel Aren't I the same James Cook? I must resolve to fight the tide Secure providence on my side Haven't I done it times before? I must succeed Just once more There was a time when goals were set Objectives met, passions pure my fame secure Am I not the same James Cook? Am I not the same James Cook? After a month-long voyage heading northeast, Captain Cook first sighted North America near present-day Oregon. He then headed up the Pacific coast, past Vancouver Island, and mapped the shoreline of Alaska, finally reaching the Bering Strait, where the resolution headed into the Arctic Circle between Asia and North America. Continuing the search for the Northwest Passage, weeks went by in which sailors experienced unrelenting cold, seeing only snow, sleet and ice. Adding to their discomfort was their fear that their small wooden vessel, propelled only by wind and manpower, would become trapped in frozen ice or be fatally damaged by one of the many ominous icebergs. Gales, 
dance fog Frozen daggers hanging from the yards A wooden vessel, fragile and slight Wandering through a wilderness of white Brutal cold, chill to the bone Will I never ever see my home? Northwest passage. How far, how far is our goal? How far, how far I'll go as far as man can go. Cruel sleet. In frost, going further, but at what cost? Giant ice hills pass us by. If one should strike, we all will die. Ominous white fields lie ahead. Locked in ice is a sailor's dread. The Northwest Passage How far, how far Is it here? How far, how far How far should men be forced to go? An ice island world Of beauty and horror Feeling admiration Sensing danger Ice islands everywhere Deepening each man's fear This ghostly eeriness Only adds to our distress Sea lions and snow bears dwell here well For a British tar this is hell The Northwest Passage How far, how far Is it real? How far, how far We've gone as far as man should go Captain Cook decided to return to the Hawaiian Islands, which they had visited briefly on their route north, in winter to refresh their supplies and carry out repairs in preparation for renewing the search for the Northwest Passage the following spring. Initially, Cook had very good relations with the Hawaiian natives. He was treated like a god and participated in native ceremonies. However, relations started to become somewhat strained between the British visitors and their hosts. When a boat was stolen by the natives, Cook, not wishing to tarnish his legacy, felt compelled to retrieve it, and he proceeded in a heavy-handed manner. Cook tried to coax King Kalanapu to come aboard the Resolution as a hostage, but a hostile crowd gathered and the king, at the urging of his fretful wife, was hesitant to accept his friend's invitation. That, along with the presence of anxious marines and Cook's unusually hostile demeanour, angered the increasing number of Hawaiians. They then became more incensed when they heard the sound of gunfire from the bay, which was soon followed by a messenger informing them that a high-ranking chief had been shot and killed. Gunfire by the British ensued. Rocks, spears and daggers were used by the crowd, which was far superior in number. Captain Cook was attacked. He fired his gun, but he was stabbed from behind by a native who used an iron dagger, ironically forged aboard the Resolution. The great navigator was then brutally attacked and killed, as his sailors, marines and officers fled back to their ship. 
Captain Cook's body was carried some distance into the country, where it was to be subjected to the rituals deserving of a high chief. With great respect and honour, Orono, the reverential title the Hawaiians bestowed on Captain Cook, was cut into pieces. His flesh was burnt from the bones, and then those now sacred bones were distributed to the king and high-ranking chiefs. After the passage of several days, and a great deal of negotiation by Cook's crew, several Hawaiians brought two wrapped parcels containing parts of Captain Cook's remains. In fact, Cook could only be identified by a scar on his right hand, an injury he'd incurred on a surveying mission in Newfoundland. A service for Captain Cook was held at sea, with Lieutenant Burney presiding. Your ocean bids you As it once and always has To earn your laurels Of distinction your ocean bids you Your ocean bids you To your final resting place With honor and fame Left behind Your ocean bids you Speed, Captain Cook, a man unlike any other. You've guided us through thick and thin, ever been our guiding light, ever striving to do what's best. We'll carry on your final quest Godspeed, Captain Cook Okay, men, get back to work. It's what the captain would have wanted. Godspeed, Captain Cook. Your journals and charts finally done. The storm within is calm at last. You paid for that the highest price Your soul's turmoil a mystery Your exploits part of history Godspeed, Captain Cool It would be 11 months after the tragic death of James Cook that the news of his demise would reach London. The First Lord of the Admiralty made a personal visit to Elizabeth Cook to inform her of her husband's death and told her that she and her three boys would receive a pension of £300 a year. In addition, a coat of arms would be created in Captain Cook's honour. He also gave her the Bible used at his burial, and a number of letters that he had addressed to her. Some now see Cook as a symbol of European colonial expansion, but the real James Cook was actually quite a different man. 
Coming from poverty in rural Yorkshire, England, raised among the pacifist and hard-working Quakers, he dreamed of sailing to faraway lands in the Pacific since he was a boy, and he achieved that dream. Cook came in peace. He was an explorer, not a conqueror. Indeed, the President of the Royal Society at the time, Lord Morton, had specifically instructed Cook, before his first great Pacific voyage, to regard native populations as human creatures, the work of the same omnipotent author. Morton also added, no European nation has the right to occupy any part of their country without their voluntary consent. As Fred McKinnon and I conducted research into creating our Captain Cook musical, we came to view James Cook as a very humane man who, like us all, had imperfections. Sadly, those imperfections, including ambition, ultimately led to his demise. He was an extraordinary individual, though, who, in the 18th century, changed the map of the world. He was a man of the Enlightenment and a leading figure in an age of scientific exploration. We certainly believe that in the history of the world, James Cook is truly one of our great heroes. I'd just like to mention a few credits. Dan Burnett sang on Ice Islands and Land Ho. Phil Smith sang on Godspeed Captain Cook. Sarah Lipman sang on So Long Gone. Eddie Lawler sang on The Old Man Has Seen Better Days. Dan Meisen played drums on all tracks apart from The Old Man Has Seen Better Days, Let Peace Prevail in New Zealand and Cook's Lament. Dan Burnett played keyboards on So Long Gone. All songs are written by Tim Hunter and Frederick McKinnon, and you can get the album from timmusicworld.bandcamp.com. It'd be great to see some of you at the concerts later in the year, so keep a lookout on timmusicworld.com for more information. And that's the end of this podcast. And I'll see you all again in May, on May the 10th, for the next podcast.